Thanks very much, everyone, and welcome. My name is Christian Jacob. I work for the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment here at Monash University. And I've come to talk to you about an age-old dream of humankind, which is predicting the future. We always want to predict the future. We always wanted to predict the future. We go to great lengths to predict the future. For instance, we use horoscopes, we read tea leaves, we employ crystal balls, and people actually pay a lot of money to know about the future by those means. It wouldn't be a STEM talk if I was going to tell you how meteorologists read tea leaves to predict the weather or the climate. Um, so you might guess that uh, science can actually help make some of the predictions we are particularly interested in. And uh, we actually experienced a silent revolution. It's silent because none of you would have noticed, um, but every one of you uses the outcome of this revolution of the 20th century science every day. And if you're using it in this form, you go on the Bureau of Meteorology's website and you look up what the weather is going to be tomorrow, in three days, in five days, next week. And I bet you, you never thought about how do they actually make these forecasts. More importantly, something else has happened over the last couple of decades, and that is we've noticed our climate is changing. If we stick a thermometer into the Earth, as is done here, we find that over the last sort of 100, 150 years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the Earth has warmed by about a degree. And, and not only would we like to know why this happened and what happened, um, we would also like to know, will this continue? What might happen in the future? What might the consequences be for all of us if um, this trend of rising temperatures continues? Not only do the temperatures rise, a degree doesn't sound a particular large amount, does it? It doesn't really frighten us if it's a degree warmer, but it turns out a degree warmer globally has consequences locally that are much larger than just that one degree change. So for instance, as shown in the graph at the bottom right, um, C, ice over the Arctic has reduced in its extent by almost 50%, not quite yet, since uh, the early 1980s. So we have a strong impact of this warming of the planet on all sorts of systems. We know it's us. Um, we're not going to talk about this today too much, um, but we know that the warming of the Earth goes together with an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In pre-industrial times, the concentration was 280 parts per million, don't worry too much about the units, but the number was 280 and it's now 405. This is of last, as of last week, and the Earth is currently breathing in carbon dioxide. So by the time it's breathing out again, which is when uh, the northern hemisphere goes into winter, it will be up above the 410 mark, we think. So this is a, a, a large change in carbon dioxide. We've looked for the sources. Where might have that carbon dioxide have come from? Might it have come from natural sources? And the answer is simply no. It has come from human activity. So knowing the temperature has gone up, knowing that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a cause, knowing that we have added this carbon dioxide, and knowing that our industrial activity will continue, perfectly legitimate question that you may have is, what's going to happen to the temperature of the Earth? in the next 100 years, next 50 to 100 years. And this is where science has evolved beyond what any of us would have imagined even in 1950. So it's a very short period of time by scientific standards. So what do we need to do to make this prediction? What do we need to do to find out what might happen to the Earth temperature and other things on Earth over the next 100 years? Well, we need three ingredients. One you will have heard about, but probably never thought about what it means, is we need a climate model. We need a model of the climate. And most models you will encounter in day-to-day -day life are extrapolations of past observations, some sort of statistical assumptions are being made. Um, climate models are very different. Climate models start off with the laws of physics, which some of which are depicted here on the left. Um, these ones are particularly the ones applied to the atmosphere. And they are very familiar things to those of you who studied mathematics and physics, even in school. Because they are Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, nothing secret about this, very simple law. It's the law that mass is conserved, can't be generated, it can just move around. It's the law that energy is conserved. And there's a, a law how uh, gases that we have in the atmosphere might behave in approximation. 
from these laws, we can calculate the sorts of things that we would like to know about the weather and the climate. We can calculate the winds. That comes from Newton's second law. We can calculate the temperature. And we can add further laws to uh, conservation of moisture in the air, for instance. So that's ingredient number one. And it's kind of fascinating to know that your weather forecasts, your climate predictions, all start from those laws. They do not start from data and extrapolation of what happened over the last three days, over the last 10 years. They start with the laws of physics. That's very important to keep in mind. The second thing, as it turns out, and as, you, as will become clear in the next few slides, is we need a big computer. The picture up there is the biggest supercomputer on Earth. It's actually in China. It has 10 million cores, as they call them now. They used to be called processors, but processors have more than one computational core these days. This thing has more than 10 million. If you have an iPhone 7, you have four. If you have an iPhone 6, I'm sorry to tell you, you have only two cores in your iPhone. So this thing has 10 million. And just for fun, it uses 15 megawatts of power. That's 15,000 vacuum cleaners running at the same time, something like that. So it's a very big computer. The third thing we need is we need to know what will humans do in terms of emitting CO2 in the future. And that's actually very uncertain. We don't know. Uh, and we can't predict it. So what we have to do is we, we have to develop some scenarios. And people go away and develop those scenarios. And I want to point out two on this graph at the bottom right. The green curve is a scenario where we are really, really conscientious citizens. We actually start reducing emissions of CO2 by about 2020, which is only three years from now. And then we've reduced the emissions to zero by about 2060, 2070. So that's a very ambitious um, scenario. And then the other one we will use later is the blue one, which is the business as usual scenario. We just keep going and we just pay no heed to the idea that our climate might be changing and that we might have to do something about this. Keep those two in mind because we'll come back to them. Now, we have the laws of physics. Why not solve everything on a piece of paper and give you the answer and say the answer is 42, like it would be in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. So to implement these laws on a computer, we need to make approximations, OK? And the first approximation that we need to make is we need to divide the Earth up. And we divide it up like it's depicted here. In the horizontal, we make little boxes. In the vertical, we make little onion layers. The atmosphere becomes layers of onion. And together, that makes cubes. And then we calculate the wind, the temperature, all the numbers we are interested in in each of those cubes. Now, the laws of mathematics tell us make the cubes as small as possible to get as a more accurate answer. The computer says no, for those of you who watch Little Britain. The computer says no. Simply, even the biggest supercomputers on Earth do not allow us to use sizes of these little cubes small enough that we would be satisfied with. So we need to make compromises. Current climate models have uh, sizes of horizontal sizes of these boxes of about 100 by 100 kilometers. That's because we need to do a lot of calculations and we want to run the model for 100 years, not just for the next five days like a weather forecast would. You can see the consequences of these approximations on this slide. Is anybody from Tasmania in the room? Can you spot Tasmania on this map? It's gone. So you can already see a consequence of the approximation. If you wanted to make a climate prediction for Tasmania with this kind of model, this one, by the way, is 250 by 250 kilometer boxes, you'd be out of luck. So we cannot make a climate prediction for Tasmania using this model. New Zealand is slightly better off. North Island, one box. South Island, one box. But you can already tell that that's not going to give a very accurate prediction because the mountains over the South Island are very important and they're clearly not well represented by a single box that represents the entire South Island of New Zealand. It gets worse. We need to make further approximations. By making these boxes, we're excluding certain things that happen in the atmosphere from being included in our calculations. And it's all the things that are smaller than our boxes. So in the example here, it's thunderstorms. A thunderstorm is quite small. You know, it covers a, a few kilometers by a few kilometers. So if you have a 100-kilometer box and you average over it, all thunderstorms are gone. That wouldn't be a problem if thunderstorms weren't important to the climate. Turns out they are. So we have to reintroduce them by what I call little models in the big model. And the little models in the big model, an example for this is on the top right here. And that's actually my own personal research, is devising these little models 
of thunderstorms as they live in, in our big climate models. And we end up with a whole other set of equations that are these little models. But again, we made another approximation. So by this point, you should ask, well, given all these approximations, how good are these models? Oh, before I tell you that, I tell you one other thing. I only talked about the atmosphere. The climate system isn't just the atmosphere. It's also the ocean. It's also the land. It's the ice on the Earth. All of them interact with each other um, to make up our climate. So not only do we need models of the atmosphere, we need a model of the land surface, we need a model of the ice, we need a model of the ocean. Many of them start with physical equations. The ocean, for instance, is just another fluid, just like the atmosphere, um, except the atmosphere is a gas. Um, the ocean is a liquid, but the laws that govern both are not that different from each other. Um, we've since discovered that uh, keeping our vegetation constant during the calculations might be a bad idea because as the climate changes, the vegetation might change. As the vegetation might change, the climate might be influenced by that vegetation change and we need to take this into account. So these models have become very, very complex and very, very complicated. How good are they, finally? On the left-hand side, you see uh, a diagram that shows lots and lots of little colored curves. Each of those curves is a one climate model on Earth. There's about 35 in this uh, picture. They are run all over the world by different countries. So there's three in America, one in China, two in Japan, and so on and so forth, one in Australia. And they all put together and they all try and simulate the climate of the 20th century, just the last century. And the black curve is the observed temperature. The little wiggly curves is one climate model each trying to represent the temperature and the red thick line is the average of all the models. And what you can see is that to first order, the, climate, the models do a quite a good job at representing the temperature increase in particular in the 1980s to the 2000s. They then diverge a little bit towards the end of the period. That's well understood. But you can also see there's quite a bit of uncertainty in this. So every model is slightly different, right? And so together they follow the path really well and we can make some good uh, predictions from them. But there is uncertainty in our uh, ability to estimate how the climate behaves. On the right-hand side, we see rainfall. Now, we see arrows in rainfall, and they are a few percent. Uh, where it doesn't rain much, they can go up to 100%, but we don't really care much because it doesn't rain much. Um, this looks like a lot, but, but remember how we started. We started by writing down the laws of physics, approximating them, putting them in a computer, and it's actually quite remarkable that we can reproduce to first order how rainfall is distributed on the Earth. This is an average picture. We can even reproduce reasonably well how this changes, obviously, from season to season, but also um, from decade to get decade in the uh, climate system. All right, so what about the future then? If we are confident, we can make some predictions. What do these uncertainties imply? What do we know, what don't we know from these climate models about the future? So the top left graph is perhaps the most important one. That's the evolution of the global mean temperature. And uh, the blue line is the low emission scenario that I pointed out earlier where we are really doing something really quickly. The red one is the business as usual. The thick line is the average of all the models and the uh, shading ind indicates the range of the answers we get from the various models. Several things to note. We, you've all heard about climate model uncertainty and maybe we can't do anything about climate change because we don't know what's going to happen. Well, the first thing you see from this graph, the biggest uncertainty isn't coming from the climate models. It's actually coming from what humans will do. Because the difference between the red and the blue, blue is much larger than the spread within each of them. So they diverge by about 2050. We know which emission scenario we are following, um, independent of how good or bad our models are at predicting global mean temperatures. Then there is model uncertainty, um, which we already discussed, comes from these approximations that we have to make along the way. The bottom graph, just underneath the temperature graph, shows you sea ice in the Arctic in September, at the end of the summer in the Arctic. And we see that in the business as usual scenario, pretty much from 2060 onwards, the Arctic will be ice-free in summer. There will be no more ice. Whereas if we uh, have followed the uh, more ambitious reduction scenario, we get the blue lines, and so we will always have some ice in the Arctic in summer. Now, you might not care whether there's ice in the Arctic in summer. You may even looking, look forward to a cruise, but other beings who live in the Arctic are quite worried. Um, 
On the right, you see maps of, of temperature change on the top and precipitation change at the bottom. I put this in because I wanted you to get a sense of the uncertainty. So where there's a little stipple on these maps, again, the left is the low emission, right is high emission, top is temperature, bottom is precipitation. And really, um, everywhere where there's a little dot on these maps, we have confidence in the answer because all the models say the same thing, they have the same sign, and the change is much larger than the natural variability that we encounter by just observing the current climate. So for temperature, when you hear predictions of climate about temperature, you can be pretty confident that we're doing a very good job at, on those. The bottom one is precipitation, and there isn't that many dots. Instead, you see this hatching all over the map, especially for the low emission scenario, but over Australia, even for the high emission scenario, most of this is hatched. And what that means is that there's large uncertainty. The models really don't agree very well. And even where they agree, the change is small compared to the variability that we experience from year to year in the current climate. So we are really not very confident in making predictions of rainfall. And again, that comes about because of this uh, uncertainty we introduce by having to represent things that are smaller than grid boxes um, in different ways by using these mo little models within the models. Rainfall almost always is a small process, small scale process. It almost always falls from very small clouds in the atmosphere. All right, bringing us back to where we started and also to where I started my career, um, how good's the scientific revolution then been for us? Well, if you don't really care about what happens in 100 years, you do care what happens three or five days from now every day and don't pretend you don't. Most people are obsessed with weather forecasts. Here's an evolution of the quality of the weather forecasts uh, from the place where I started my career, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, deemed to be the number one in global weather forecasting on Earth using numerical models. The top lines, the thick lines, are always the northern hemisphere. The bottom lines are the southern hemisphere. Um, blue is day three forecast, and the measure as shown on the axis is a measure of quality. So as it goes up, the quality has gone up. Red are five-day forecasts, green are seven-day forecasts, yellow are 10-day forecasts. And what's amazing about this curve, the one thing you can read from this is that we can make a, a five-day forecast that is as good uh, as a three-day forecast was 20 years ago. So the gain through science in making weather predictions is about one day per decade, all right? So we're getting better and better. So to conclude, I could have told you that today would be a miserable day about five days ago when I could have only told you 10, 20 years ago, three days ago. That's actually a big gain if you think about not just you and your umbrella, but industry, agriculture, places that have to plan based on the weather and based on the climate as well. So thank you very much.